Hello. No, Noir Vortex here, and I'm going to do another. This is going to be another funny philosophy video. And in this one, I'm going to explore something slightly different to the last few ones, which are mostly dealing with existentialism, and nihilism, and uh, transhumanism, and transhumanism, which will kind of root for nihilism anyway. But what I'm going to talk about today is more than this art, so it'll be slightly different to the other. Um, videos I did, which dealing with more kind of hardcore philosophical concepts, uh, just more dealing with aesthetics and uh, the history of art and how that has progressed, I guess. So, uh, I'm going to mostly be dealing with modernist art and modernism in the 20th century because that is the mo area I'm most familiar with in terms of art. You have postmodernism now, which but to be honest, a lot of that's very dry, academic. I personally find most of it fucking boring as shit. So I want to try and deal with modernism. Now, modernism is a, a paradigm in art which emerged in the 20th century, early 20th century um, trend, I guess, essentially towards. Um, a lot of it had to do with. Um, well, a lot of it was kind of influenced somewhat by the uh, philosophy in the sense of building another world, building a better world. A lot of it had a technologi technological utopianism to it, I suppose. Um, so in terms of art movements that would be associated with modernism, um, and it's very, very varied and kind of multi pranged So I'll approach each one with a kind of general overview. Um, so you had um, the development of post-impressionism, and we'll start from the beginning, I guess. Uh, Post-impressionism. So impressionism was um, a movement that emerged um, where instead of trying to directly um, portray a scene exactly as it would be seen by the eye, the impre artist's impression of a scene um, became more important. So, and this often sat in terms of aesthetics, you'd have more of a, there's a few different styles, Pointillism, um, so you'd have more of a more of a subjective interpretation of the world. Uh, now probably the most famous point or artist that people will be able to recognise in terms of a well-known post-impressionist is Van Gogh. You know the Dutch painter, the ear, the prostitute, all the rest of it. He had a man of depression. He was quite a tortured soul constantly poor, kind of a lot of the tropes of what a tortured artist has come from Van Gogh, essentially, in the modern day age still. Uh, he was a, uh, um, but he took on what Impressionism, the Impressionists had done with the uh, brushstroke. So um, Impressionism, uh, a, lot of, most, a lot of Impressionism was about portraying the light, essentially. It's about how to best portray light in a kind of aesthetic way, I suppose. Um, now, Van Gogh kind of took it to another level, and this is where post-impressionism kind of starts the ball rolling. Uh, Van Gogh, in a lot of ways, was the first modernist, with, in some respects. Um, and then, uh, charting up further, from impressionism, post-impressionism from Van Gogh, this then developed into a kind of expressionist paradigm in the uh, aspects of art. So well-known expressionist painters, and this all kind of emerged in the early 1920s, and then alongside this you had Cubism developed as well, but I'll go into that later. Um, actually, I'll go into more at the same time. So there was, um, you had artists like, well, fast-forwarding a few decades now, um, we had artists like Brock and Picasso. Well, we're going to be into the Cubes now. Who, um, and then you had Cezanne as well, of course, who was incredibly important in the development of modern art in painting, anyway. Um, so, Brock and Picasso, anyway. I could go a lot further into Cezanne, but it's already been five minutes, so I can't do that. Um, Picasso and Brock developed a system called. Um, Cubism, which is well known now, kind of well established, people know what it is when they see it. But what with Cubism, uh, Picasso and Brock basically 
up until that point, all rep most art was representational in the sense that it represented something outside. So it was a it was it wasn't always objective per se, but it had a it was an objective portrayal of a world. There was obviously a romantic, dreamlike aspect to a lot of it. Look at William Blake, for example, but um, or visionary aspect. But where Picasso and Braque kind of made the break with tradition was with um, representing a object or a thing from multiple viewpoints, skewering it, and basically using reality in the picture plane as a form of uh, um, as a raw template and then breaking that template down into many different pieces. And there's two forms of cubism as well, which is so you have synthetic cubism, cubism and uh, analytical cubism, I think, the language is used for. I'm not an expert in this, I just kind of know the basic history of that. Uh, synthetic being a kind of more flattening out, broken up planes, and then analytical is very, very kind of hyper abstract. You can't even, well, basically, you can only tell very little small pieces of the original one. Uh, image of a person or a thing. So that happened. Brock and Picasso were the big figures that developed cubism. And then alongside cubism, uh, around about the same time, I think roughly, or maybe just a little bit after, we had expressionism. And expressionism was kind of the development of post-impressionism and Van Gogh. Uh, groups like the Brucker, the German gr group of German expressionists, amongst my favourite artists, in fact, and uh, the Blue Rider, which is Kandinsky. And uh, Kandinsky, as well, is very important in terms of the development of abstract art, pure abstraction. So let's define some terms. Uh, representational art, representing things in front of you, obviously, so, you know, that kind of tradition of um, representing the world. Uh, Non-objective art and abstract art is kind of the opposite of that, so uh, pure subjectivity, really. Uh, hopefully I don't have to define those terms. Uh, pure subjectivity is, it could be, I mean, I'm an issue with Kandinsky, actually, Rush, interesting Russian artist, he... Um, he started quite late, so he's a lawyer, 30 years old, but anyway, the problem. he developed the idea of a non-objective art, which is an art which comes purely from women. He did a lot of stuff about how it related to music in his mind. So he would, re he would do art that doesn't directly refer to anything, not representational, but abstract. And, yeah, what was I? So, you had the, all this going on, this kind of melting pot of different things going on around about the same time, in the early 20th century, 1920s. Um, you also had Dadaism. Um, Dada was a response to the First World War. Um, it was a kind of absurdist response, a kind of nihilism of the spirit, essentially, in the arts. Uh, a lot of the artists in it had been through the First World War and kind of just saw the meaninglessness of that industrial conflict that had on humanity, they kind of felt that there was no real answer in politics. It kind of, Dada was kind of like the first anti-art art movement essentially, it was just because a lot of, with modernism, um, uh, modernist art, a lot of it was about we're going to create this new world, we're going to create this new utopia. Look at the, um, the history of avant-garde in Soviet Russia, this is really quite interesting. It's not really talked about that much, so we will kind of go into that, I know I'm jumping around a lot, but what to cover in however many minutes. Um, in the avant garden in Russia, you had the development of a kind of exciting, kind of science based, but also abstract art. Science in the sense of um, not pure science, but like a kind of scientific, objective art, that non objective art is what they wanted to create. Uh, which you had figures like Malevich and um, a few others, I can't remember all off the top of my head. But they tried to develop a kind of art that was aligned to um, the socialist utopia they basically wanted to create, obviously, the Russian Revolution, which was very rapidly crushed by the socialist realists, i.e. Stalin and his bunch of cronies, essentially. Um, but yeah, so there you've got all this kind of very interesting stuff, not even to mention futurism going on. Um, futurism uh, sprung from Italy, had its, again, its version in Russia that was going on at roughly corresponding times. Um, futurism was a movement that wanted, they wanted to for speed and noise and they wanted to kind of reassess these things. They wanted to smash the old art. They wanted to they were kind of very fatalistic and all and 
well, ultimately, a lot of them, and Marinetti, and kind of went to a kind of fascistic interpretation of uh, futurism. No, not all, the, not all the Italian futurists went this way, but the, kind of the vast body of them, I think, did. Basically, go into this, they kind of allied themselves with Mussolini, etc. But yeah, um, <clears throat> the modernists of the 20th century had big ideas, very big ideas, utopian, certainly, and they wanted to. They wanted to change the world. They thought that art could change the world as well. That's one of the key differences, I guess, between um, modernist art, which is now the art of the past, and kind of the paradigm we're in now, but which is kind of always shifting a bit, which is this kind of wry postmodern kind of look at everything. Um, postmodernism is basically um, uh, everything kind of is reinvented constantly, and there's there's no final answers, no final utopian. It's kind of a very pessimistic view of the world in a lot of ways. So you'll see a lot of jokes at uh, art, which is essentially jokes about art and jokes about meaning. And a lot of it's really kind of boring to me. I'm kind of more interested in... Um, I'm kind of more interested in a kind of more romantic um, view of art, which is that it, has, it provides a meaning and a solace for the fact that the world isn't perfect, but that's by the by. I don't want to give it too much into my own kind of philosophies of art in this video because I want it to just be a general overview of modernist philosophy and what it's art. So yeah, obviously the first and second world wars, these are huge world events that crafted basically the history of art. Um, you had Picasso's Guernica, one of the masterpieces of the 20th century, if not the masterpiece in a lot of ways. I'm just going to make direct reference to a few different works now to kind of make it um, tie this together kind of way that people might understand. Um, had Guernica, Picasso, her reaction to the bombing of um, a Spanish town in the Franco, um, you know, the Franco, the Spanish Civil War. Um, you had um, Diego Rivera's man as the control of the center of the universe. Diego Rivera was a um, Mexican muralist, communist, and um, artist. Now his, uh, piece Man at the Centre of the Universe, one of the most, I think it's one of the most fascinating murals of the history, especially in the history of the piece. He did a, um, he was offered the chance to um, paint this for the Rockefellers in America, which he took up, and uh, it got smashed to pieces because of his communist views. He put a, basically he put a, a Lenin in one of the pictures, which was like explicitly stating his views. Um, there's a lot of crossover as well with, uh, I haven't even mentioned surrealism as well, so I was talking about Dadaism earlier on. Now Dadaism um, eventually kind of wound down a bit in the group, and surrealism kind of emerged from that, I guess, essentially. Or was very directly influenced by Dadaism. Or was, it's like a more different version of it that kind of evolved in the, for Paris, mostly, as the centre of uh, Parisian art. Surrealism. And now we're in about the 1920s, 30s, I think. Before we go to the 40s and 50s, one of the surrealists were the, kind of one of the dominant forces in, uh, in art for uh, a lot of the pre war and post war period, but then they kind of dwindled a bit after that. Um, so the surrealists kind of were very influenced by the discoveries of Freud um, and the dream and the unconscious, the more conscious mind. So the Surrealists were all about portraying the dream world and the, the um, coming to, trying to you know, kind of break through all these conventions of human society through the dream. So you have Dali, a very obvious example, you have um, um, Yas Tongi, um, Andre Breton, who was the um, Grand high proof of surrealism, as he was called. A lot of poets, surrealists, um, some interesting Dadaist poets as well, Tristan Zaro, for example. They were kind of trying to play with the language a lot more and, uh, and basically kind of screw with it in a lot of ways. Very interesting group of artists, but yeah, see how that. Um, fast forward a bit more, because obviously we're trying to cover a lot within probably just in 20 minutes, art history of the whole 20th century. You had. Um, so the war's happened now, the Second World War, that's done. Then the real big shift in the art world was 
a lot of the um, European surrealists, etc., had migrated to America because of the war. You know, a lot of them were Jewish, a lot of them were you know, dissidents in one way or another, whether they be communists, socialists, or were involved in kind of so called as the Nazis, you know, the Nazis would have called them like deviants, I suppose, essentially. So a lot of them had to bugger off and run off to America, which they did in their droves. So uh, Europe, which had traditionally been the um, uh, centre ground for the arts and culture, was in ruins, obviously, because of the Second World War, and you know, Germany's um, and the Nazis really quite not so bad terrible will to shit um, so they all, they all shifted over there and that very much influenced the development of modern art in the next 30 20 30 years with the abstract expressionists which was one of the last big modernist movements essentially so the abstract expressionists took the what the expressionists did which was um, the highlighting the subjectivity of the human experience, their big themes like tragedy, ecstasy, and so forth. And then they uh, took the surrealist automatism, which automatism is basically um, not really thinking much about what you're doing in terms of just like, you know, you meet your marks, and you don't think consciously while you're doing it, because it's surrealists. And uh, a lot of the surrealists came over there with their ideas. A lot of American artists. Uh, synthesize those ideas into their practice. Um, Ashil Gorky is one of the best and um, most interesting of the artists around that time. Quite a tragic life, he's um, escaped from the Armenian genocide and he helped, he kind of took on the thing of aping a lot of modernist styles and then kind of emerged his own biomorphic style um, of abstraction. Very interesting artist. And then the big, 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 big figures, I suppose, in abstract expressionism. Jackson Pollock, everyone's going to be, be familiar with his images of drip paintings. Um, he started off as a kind of Jungian, uh, working with Jungian themes, Jung being the psychoanalyst and kind of like a um, guy who went over Freud, who kind of like evolved out of Freud's theory. He moved beyond it, I would argue, but that's because I'm purely like Jung. I like Jung. Um, so yeah, so you have these abstract expressions basically took synthesized a few of these different movements into so a lot of the paintings were big grand statements some of them in my opinion were kind of I love some of their work some of them like I'm not so fond of um, um, Barnett and Newman kind of, I mean they're all right they're kind of like huge canvases with like two strips down and stuff and they've got these kind of like overbearingly heavy titles Rothko I like from having seen his work uh, Mark Refka was a Jewish immigrant from Russia. Um, he developed a whole idea around colour field work. Colour field is like a big format. And then, uh, yeah. Um, but I could, I'm going to try and keep this 20 minutes. So that was basically kind of a way the abstract impressionists, and they were all kind of tortured. It was very male dominated as well, even though there's some really, really good female painters in there, like Lee Krasner. Alan Frankenfeller, um, um, uh, de Kooning. De Kooning's another big figure as well in the abstract expression, being one of the best ones. Uh, but he had a wife, Elaine de Kooning, as well, etc. Et so that was quite male dominated, but it was, and they were all a bit tortured. I uh, can't really go into more detail, really, because yes, that's how. Um, after you had the development of abstract expressionism, you had um, pop art, which is Warhol, which in a way kind of marked the end of the tradition of the 20th century avant-garde okay, instead of it becoming about art being a singular uh, romantic pursuit in some ways almost like a, you saw yourself as like a tragic figure pop art made it this much more detached kind of like clever kind of the post-modernist you know we're not we're part of the commercialism so we should reflect it for you um i'm almost at 20 minutes now so i think i've talked enough about the history of one um, quite good that I've actually managed to condense that down to 20 minutes. So yeah, you, like I said, it all kind of roots. I mean, I was literally, I could probably literally talk for 20 more minutes about the subject. Um, but obviously there's a lot, uh, with modernism there was a lot of different influences moulding together and creating something new out of it. A lot of it kind of comes from the you know, kind of theoretic cool side of modernism came from Marxism in some respects. Um, and 
I want to end this now, but um, a lot of it was about reinvigorating art with a kind of energy, a lot of which came from primitive art as well, if you look back in it even further. Um, or so called primitivism, which was, uh, since the obvious examples to me, there are Picasso being influenced by masks, even Munch himself was influenced in the screen by um, a death mask he saw from the tribal culture, or like it, I think it's a mummy actually. Anyway, I could talk a lot more about Munch as well because I really like Edmund Munch and he's an artist I have a lot of time for. But I've got to end this now, so I'm just going to end it on the screen because that feels appropriate. And as an expressionist myself, that, uh, I still consider myself an expressionist. History, these the guys I look up to. Goodbye.